Paul Powell, in his book, The Complete Disciple, he describes a picture that I love of a wagon train in the Old West. Nighttime has fallen and the wagons have sort of circled up for the night for protection. And in the center of the circle is this campfire and this group of rugged men all gathered round. And the wagon master, this old muscular man with this unkept beard, he has this map spread out before him. And on the map is this heavy black line which zigzags across the map showing the course that they've taken. And it seems they've veered north a bit and, and then south, but their main direction has always continued to be west. Evidently, there's been an argument over which way to go next. But, but, but the wagon master has placed his one finger on the end of that black line, while with his other arm he's pointing towards some distant hazy mountains, and he seems to be saying, we, we may have to go south uh, around a mountain or, or, or north across the river, but our direction will always be west. That's how we're going to reach our destination, by always forever moving westward. Friends, it seems that one of the secrets of a successful life is to have one's eyes fixed on a goal and then to pursue that goal with all one's heart. Just as those early pioneers were, were determined to go westward, so every person who seems to make a difference in our world has their eyes fixed on a worthy goal. And as we focus during this, this Lenten, series on our seasons of, of testing, how true that, that one of the great tests of life is not only having a worthy goal, but then keeping our eyes fixed on the prize. Let's take the Apostle Paul. Paul was one of the most influential people who ever lived, and one of the reasons he was so effective was that his eyes were firmly fixed on that which simply could not be surpassed. Let's listen again to some of his words in this morning's lesson. I want to know Christ, to know the power of His resurrection, and to participate in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Wow. What a powerful proclamation of Paul's passion for serving Christ. In fact, isn't this why he helped so many people over the last 2,000 years? Paul knew what was truly important in life, and he gave himself completely to accomplishing that very thing. You know, a lot of people they end up living ineffective lives because they don't keep the main thing, the main thing. It's one of the great tests of life because one of the most important lessons of life involves setting and then maintaining priorities, putting first things first and not frittering life away because without priorities, the athlete, fails to win the prize. Couples fail to achieve marital happiness. Businesses, they, they go bankrupt. Churches grow stagnant and decline. Students, they, they, they fail to, to make the grade. E. Stanley Jones, in his book, Conversion, says that when people first started voting in, in India, India you may not know, is the world's largest democracy with over 200 million voters. And many of those voters were 
illiterates. However, they, they overcame that difficulty by, by placing their ballot box in a row, each of those boxes with a symbol representing the various parties. In this way, uh, the illiterate knew who they were voting for. However, one man, says Jones, took his ballot and, and he tore it into ten pieces. And then he took each of these pieces and, and placed them in the ten boxes. In effect, he, he tried to, to vote for all ten parties, but what he didn't realize that what he did in so doing was actually vote for none. You know, there's a little one-page test that I give to young, engaged couples when they go through premarital counseling with me. It's called the Christian Married Lifestyle Inventory. It has six abilities on it, and I ask them to, to rate themselves and their mate-to-be on a scale from one to five, and, and one of those six is the subject of discipline. And the test literally defines discipline as the ability to use your family's time and energy and talents to accomplish goals that are consistent with your stated values. And in essence, isn't this one of the great tests, not only of marriage, but of life itself? I asked the couple, what's the shortest distance between two points? And they, they say to me, a, a, a straight line. And I say, yeah. So, so, so let's say that you as a couple have a goal that's in keeping with your stated values. You decide that one of you needs to stay home with your kids and, and not work outside of the home. So, so to live on one income will, will mean living on a tight budget and, and being very frugal. So, so let's say that one of you sticks to that goal and, and, and doesn't spend extra money on, on impulse buying and such stays on that straight line, while the other is always straying off that line in an undisciplined fashion. If the shortest distance between two points is a straight line and discipline is that tool that helps us to get to the finish line, then what happens when one of the two of you doesn't stick to the plan? So, so then I ask them, uh, let me ask you, do the two of you have an infinite amount of, of resources? In other words, time and, and energy and, and, and talents? And of course, they, they, they sort of look at each other and they, they say, no, uh, uh, of course not. And, and then I say, then because that's true, then you're, you're going to have to use discipline to, to get to where you want to go. Where do you want to go? Isn't that the key? Where do you want to go? We only have a limited amount of resources, and in order to, to not dissipate and, and, and fritter away all of our energies by spreading ourselves too thin, by majoring on minors, in order to be effective in our work or in our home or in our communities, then we have to set priorities. Otherwise, we become like the cowboy who jumped on his horse and, and rode off in all different directions, or, or, or the voter who tore his ballot into pieces and, and ended up voting for, for nobody, or the couple who never reached their goals because they, they didn't have the discipline to focus on what was really important to them. They frittered it all away on stuff that didn't really matter. Folks, isn't this the real test of life? Not spending our lives on trivial pursuits, merely moving from one triviality to another? How about the interesting news story I saw online a while back? It showed a photo making the rounds on Instagram of the top half of a humpback whale that was emerging from the surface of the water. It was this beautiful image, but what was happening in the background that's what was getting the most attention because in the background, you saw this man sitting in his sailboat and he was, he was glued to his smartphone. And what was baffling was that this guy was just a few feet away from, from where this whale was surfacing and yet he, he didn't even seem to notice. 
picture was taken at a place known for whale watching, and, and Instagram showed five different pictures of whales with the same boat in the background, and yet in each of the images, the man's eyes are, are, are focused on his phone, not, not the whale. <laughs> what a poignant metaphor for a lot of our lives. We focus on the things that matter little, while the truly important goes un unattended. Most successful people have a plan for their lives, and at the top of the plan sheet is that which is of most importance. We're told that when retired football coach Bobby Bowden played baseball in college, that he never had hit a home run. In fact, his senior year at, at Howard College, he was the only player to not have hit a home run. But, but one day, he hits this line drive, and, and he makes it around first, second, he gets to third, and, and the third base coach is, is waving him in, go, go! And, and when he touched the home plate, the team went ballistic. They came out and slapped him on the back and put him up on his shoulders to carry him back to the dugout. He would finally hit a home run, but meanwhile, no one seemed to notice that the first baseman was yelling for the catcher to throw him the ball, and then he caught it, and the umpire said, you're out! It seems that when Bowden ran around the bases celebrating his first home run, that he had failed to touch first base. So the one home run of his entire career was negated, and who knows, maybe that's why he became a football coach. I'd imagine that, that on more than one occasion he told his football players that if you don't take care of first base, then it doesn't matter what else you do. Yeah, successful living is taking care of the things that matter the most. A great exercise would be for each of us this morning to, to, to make a list of five things in our life that are absolutely essential. And if this was a workshop and not a worship service, then I would pause right now and I would have each of you make such a list. And maybe you could do that later this afternoon. Where, where does your spouse fall on that list or your children or your work or, or your responsibilities to the community? And, and where does your faith fall? fall on that list. Daily devotions and, and worship attendance and tithing and using your gifts to build up Christ's church and your energies to go out and, and to lead others to Him. And then once you are, are, are finished with that assessment of how well does your weekly schedule reflect your, your priorities, then, then you have to decide how, how willing are you to, to change so you can become the kind of person that, that Christ has called you to be. Let's take the, the Christian college student who soon after entering that school put over his dorm room door the letter V. And because of that V, he, he endured all kinds of ridicule, and yet he, he, he paid it no attention. And despite everyone's attempts, he wouldn't disclose the secret of the letter. And when, when the four years were finally over and graduation day came, that student was appointed to deliver the valedictory address for the school. And it was then that the mystery of that letter V was revealed. It stood for valedictorian. And that letter on that door held before him during his four years the goal that, that, that he had set for, for himself. So let me ask you, what, what letter could you put over the door of your house that, that would remind you as you leave your house every day what your life is all about? Would you put up the letter M that, that stands for, for money or, or, or P for, for, for prominence or, or position? Maybe it's a good idea every once in a while to look at the letter that, that you've put over your door as a reminder of where you're going in life. As I asked earlier, where do you want to go? Apparently, the Apostle Paul had discovered where he wanted to go. Perhaps you recall his backstory. 
Before Paul was Paul, the the apostle for Christ, he was Saul, the, the Pharisee, and he had an entirely different life focus and mission because every day he made it his singular goal to hunt down Christians across the Roman Empire to kill them and persecute them and imprison them. He was a very driven individual with a zeal to stamp out what he thought to be a false religion following a false Messiah who were making false teachings. And so he devoted his life to stamping out Christianity. And then one day while he was on his way to a town called Damascus to to do that very thing, he suddenly was blinded by by this bright light and a strange otherworldly voice said to him, Saul, why do you persecute me? And literally he had been confronted by the risen Christ. And it seems that Jesus had a reason for confronting the church's enemy, number one, because that day, though he was blinded, Saul began to see the light. And as a result, with that same singular abandon with which he hunted down Christians, he now began to serve Christ. And so his whole life changed, and, and so did his name from, from Saul to, to Paul. And that's essentially the backstory that, that we get to hear between the lines in today's lessons from Philippians 3. Here, Paul tells us about his former worldly credentials, and they were certainly impressive. Listen to them. If others think they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, then I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regards to the law of Pharisee, and as for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. Yeah, Paul says here, this is, this is who I used to be, a, a, a Pharisee with, with this impeccable pedigree, the the wunderkind of the Jewish faith, righteous, zealous, seemingly perfect. But when Jesus confronted him on that Damascus road, he discovered that all that he previously was was just a pile of garbage. It was worthless in comparison to the new life that he had discovered in serving Christ. And so with even more zeal, Listen to what he he, he proclaims, brothers and sisters. uh, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of this, but but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has now called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Wow. This one thing I, I do. And there's no stopping Someone who's got that kind of Christ-empowered focus. Paul no longer was operating out of the power of his own flesh. He now had the power of the Holy Spirit as the wind beneath his wings giving him the strength to, to live a life whose singular priority was based in love, loving God and loving others, not in fulfilling the law. You know, back about 20 years ago, I had a Damascus Road experience of my own. No, Jesus didn't come down in a blinding light, but it was something that forever changed my life. And just as Paul shared his testimony in this morning's lesson, let me share mine with you. We spoke a moment ago about being at a workshop rather than a worship service, and and that's where it happened. I was a young pastor. I was in my mid-30s, and I had this leadership guru come in and speak to the core leadership of our church, and and he did something that day I've never forgotten. He, He set up two tables before the workshop that were facing lengthwise away from us, and he put sheets covering over the tables. And then he asked for two volunteers to come forward. So a woman named Marty and and a man named Eric stepped forward, and they were asked to face with their backs uh, against the long end of the tables. And with their eyes remaining forward, he he then removed the plastic sheeting to expose three rows of poker chips. There were 20 white chips in the first row, 10 red chips in the second row, and five blue chips in the third row. 
And the leader told Eric and Marty that at the word go, they were to turn around and they were to pick up as many of the objects one by one on the table as they could within 15 seconds. So he said, go, and off they went. And at the end of the 15 seconds, he hollered, stop. And, and then he proceeded to ask each of them, okay, guys, let's, let's see how well you did. Marty, how, how many white poker chips did you get? Uh, I got 18, Marty said. And you, Eric, how many did you get? Uh, I got 17. Super guys, so far so good, he said. Okay, Marty, how, how many red chips did you get? Well, I, I didn't get any, Mar M Marty said. All right, Eric, how about you? How, how, did, how did you do? I, I didn't get any either. Well, well, that's too bad, guys, because, you know, the white chips were, were worth one point apiece, but the red chips were worth ten points apiece. Well, maybe you did better on the blue chips. Uh, Marty, how many blue chips did, did you get? Well, I, I didn't get, get any. Oh, oh, okay, uh, Eric, how many did you get? I didn't get any either. Well, that's really too bad, guys, because the blue chips were worth a hundred points apiece. And he then proceeded to give each of us a poker chip. And I've carried this poker chip around now for the last 20 years in my pocket. And when you leave the service today, you will get a poker chip. And he began to talk about the blue chip stuff in life. And he said, let's take my six-year-old son and I. Uh, a few months ago, I was out in the yard trimming some hedges and my little boy came out and he said daddy can i can i help and i said well josh this is kind of dangerous how about you you help daddy by taking these little clippers and going over there by the driveway retaining wall and start pulling out the weeds that are between the blocks so i went over and i got him set up and and then i went back over and, and was trimming the shrubs and when i looked over about 10 minutes later I, I noticed that he was gone and it was then that i realized that i had blown a blue chip opportunity because my son didn't really want to clip weeds he just he just wanted to spend time with me and, and that's why I carry this blue chip with me every day to remind me about what's really important and my spending all of my time on the little inconsequential chippy chippy white stuff the little one point stuff or am I focusing every day on the blue chip opportunities Folks, I, I wish I would have known that truth 30 years ago come this May when, when I graduated from, from seminary because my best friend from seminary, Carl, he asked me to be the groomsman in his wedding. Shortly after we had graduated, I, I got into my first church, and I should have said, you know, I'll, I'll move heaven and earth to be there even though it was going to be difficult. I was just starting out. I was 25 years old. I was learning about all the demands of being a pastor, and, and I was afraid to be away for a couple of days for fear that, that I wouldn't have enough time to prepare for my sermon for that Sunday right after the wedding. I get back late at night that Saturday evening. So after considering, I told Carl I didn't really think I could do it. And because of that decision, I lost a dear friend. I had blown a blue chip opportunity. And you know, as we, we talk about life's tests, sometimes we learn from some of life's greatest failures. And that was one of mine. It's one I've never forgotten. It's why when my daughter called to tell me that she was in labor this past Monday, that I dropped everything. And I drove to Ohio to get there in time for my first grandchild's birth. It was an unforgettable blue chip moment. And I wouldn't give up having been there for, for, for a million dollars. And friends, we, we could make all kinds of excuses and, and, and reasons why we major on minors and, and end up frittering away our, our lives on trivial pursuits. But successful people in any sphere, whether, whether it's the business realm or the family realm or the athletic realm or the spiritual realm, they focus on prioritizing what's most important and then doing those things consistently and well. They don't let feeling sorry for themselves or, or life's handicaps stand in their way. Yeah, Paul, he 
He could have used that excuse. After all, he said he carried around this thorn in his flesh. Instead, he proclaimed that God's power was perfected in his weakness. As we wrap up, let's take a guy named Bob Reed. You see, Bob's hands are all twisted and his feet are useless. He can't bathe or feed himself or brush his teeth or comb his hair or put on his own underwear. His, his speech drags like, like this worn-out cassette. And why? Because Bob has cerebral palsy, a disease that keeps him from driving a car or taking a walk, but it didn't keep him from graduating from high school and, and college or being a college professor or, or, or going overseas on mission trips, nor did it keep him from becoming a missionary to Portugal. One day he, he decided to, to move to Lisbon alone, and, and, and there he rented a hotel room. He began studying Portuguese, and, and he found a restaurant owner who would feed him on the off hour, and a tutor who would instruct him in the language, and he stationed himself daily in a park where he distributed brochures about Christ. And over a six-year period, he ended up leading 70 people to Jesus. Yeah. A lot of us sit around and we complain that we never have the opportunity to do anything meaningful in the world. But let me ask you, do you have cerebral palsy? Folks, what we sometimes lack is focus and commitments. In today's lesson, even though he faced every hardship imaginable, the Apostle Paul was able to proclaim, I'm done with the little white chip stuff. So this one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to forget what's behind and strain towards what a, what's ahead. I'm going to press on toward the blue chip stuff. A lot of folks live ineffective lives because they don't set priorities. Successful living is about taking care of the stuff that matters most. This is one of life's greatest tests. How are you doing with the blue chip stuff? The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Are you staying on course? Let's pray. Father, help us as your people to be blue chip kind of people. Help us to make priorities in life that count, the stuff that really matters. Help us to be like the Apostle Paul. For this we ask in Jesus' name.